more. We are live. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us in part two of this important series, Why Diversity Matters. As you may recall, if you attended part one about two weeks ago on March 4th, we discuss issues about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the legal community, specifically in the Dallas legal community as we announced the release of the Dallas law firm diversity study. For those of you who saw the um, email link, the survey itself report was linked in that announcement. And we'll also have that available for you um, during this program so that you can refer back to it. And so we have another engaging panel today. Last time we focused on recruitment issues as the survey also shows there are many, many pipeline initiatives engaging, getting more and more diverse uh, law students and diverse attorneys to enter. But what about the question of retention? The survey also showed that there are few who stay in the profession. And you will see in the panel today how suggestions on how to make the pop and perhaps some you know, opportunities for us all to consider and how we can implement programs to retain those diverse attorneys in the legal profession and in Dallas law firms. And so leading us in that discussion today is uh, my colleague, Phil Kim, who was also kind enough to serve on that survey uh, with me. And let me introduce Phil, Phil so that he can get us into the panel discussion today. Phil Kim is a partner in Haynes and Boone's Healthcare Transactions and Regulatory Group. He has extensive experience in healthcare law and focuses his practice on transactional and regulatory healthcare matters. He represents a variety of types of providers ranging from healthcare systems, hospitals, companies, in the digital health, biotechnical and medical device space, ambulatory service surgery centers, physician groups, home health providers, and other healthcare companies on the buy and sell side of mergers and acquisitions, joint ventures, and operational matters, which also include regulatory, licensure, contractual, and administrative issues. Bill has also been actively involved with organizations as a longstanding member, board member, or officer of the Dallas Asian American Bar Association, the Dallas Bar Association Health Law Section, and the State Bar of Texas Asian Pacific Interest Section and Health Law Section. So as you can imagine, Bill has been pretty busy given the current times we're living in, but still found time to give to us here today. So Phil, I'll turn it over to you and introducing the rest of our panel today. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Of um, and thank you to all of our audience members here with us today participating in this discussion um, of this very critical issue. Um, I hope the information uh, or the survey uh, and the information that you got from the survey was informative and that you all were able to gain some insight. But um, of course, there are issues that may not be readily apparent from the survey results themselves. So um, by the end of this discussion today, I hope you'll be able to take away not only additional insight into the challenges that we're facing in our community and legal industry today, but also some action items, strategies, and creative solutions that you can implement at your own firms and companies. One of the best pieces of advice uh, I ever received was that there is no such thing as a perfect law firm company or organization. And if you find it, you shouldn't go there because you will cease to make it perfect. Uh, but that doesn't mean we should ever stop striving for perfection and improvement. So we hope after today, you'll be better equipped to address some of the issues that may be holding us back in what is certainly an exciting time in the Dallas market where we've been reaching an inflection point in our history. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed panelists uh, with us today. Uh, Ricky Bonilla is a principal at Fish and Richardson, focusing his practice across all areas of commercial and intellectual property litigation with an emphasis on patents. Um, Ricky has represented hundreds of clients in U.S. district courts across the country 
um, and intellectual property disputes involving a wide variety, a wide range of uh, technologies, including e-commerce and website systems, computer network architecture, uh, computer software, encryption, communication, and mobile applications. Ricky currently serves as the firm's recruiting principal uh, in Dallas and co-chair of Latinos, the firm's Hispanic Latinx legal staff affinity group. Ricky is also head of Fish's Next Gen Initiative, which provides a voice and opportunities for newer lawyers and ensures prop, uh, proper training for Fish's associates. He began his career at Fish after joining the firm via its 1L Diversity Fellowship Program. Sakina Rashid Foster is a partner in Hands and Boone's finance uh, practice group. Her practice is focused on the representation of financial institutions and borrowers in complex commercial loan transactions, as well as airlines and aviation matters. Sakina has experience in advising banks, private equity firms, uh, corporations, and individuals in connection with senior uh, and subordinated financing, uh, including drafting documentation and negotiating deal points for syndicated and single bank loan facilities, asset-based lending, acquisition financing, real estate construction, loans, mortgage warehouse lending, and loans secured by unique collateral, such as mortgage servicing rights. Sakina is also on the firm's Partners Compensation Committee and is very active in advancing DE&I, not only within Haynes and Boone, but also within the community at large through local organizations such as the Dallas Asia Mart American Bar Association. Jill Lewis is a partner at Perkins Cooey, serving as the firm's Dallas office managing partner. Jill focuses her practice on advising companies with growth-oriented, liquidity-creating, and transformational strategies. Her experience includes leading strategic transactions for entrepreneurs, private equity sponsors, and portfolio companies, as well as members of the Fortune 50 with partic particular emphasis on infrastructure, multi-location retail transportation, manufacturing, and industrial sector matters. Uh, in addition to her experience in private practice, Jill served as the GC for a large private equity portfolio company with over a billion dollars in annual revenue operating in 45 states. She also served as general counsel for a multinational uh, shared workspace company with $600 million in revenue uh, and operating both owned and franchise locations in all 50 states, Australia, Brazil, Canada, England, France, and Mexico. For more than 10 years, she has led the transactions group uh, for the retail operating company of a global courier delivery service, managing commercial and uh, technology transactions in North America and Asia, and uh, launching the same day transportation delivery service there. Um, active in both her professional and personal communities, Jill is a member of the board of trustees of Howard University. Stacy Morris is Senior Vice President, Deputy General Counsel, and Secretary at AT&T. She is responsible for all activities associated with the AT&T Board of Directors. Stacy previously served as General Attorney and Associate General Attorney, uh, Associate General Counsel for AT&T Services, Inc., where she was responsible for legal advice and counsel for consumer markets in Atlanta, Georgia. After joining SBC's uh, legal staff in Dallas in 2001, Stacy held attorney and senior counsel positions in industry markets and global markets. <clears throat> in 2006, she was appointed senior counsel consumer marketing in San Antonio. In 2008, she was promoted to general attorney, AT&T mobility and consumer markets. Um, in July 2010, her position relocated to Atlanta and in December 2012, she was appointed general attorney and associate general counsel consumer markets. Stacy was born and raised in Oklahoma City, and she received her BA from SMU and her JD from UVA. Last but not least, Albert Tan is a partner in the finance section of Haynes & Boone, where he began his legal career at the firm 27 years ago, and he is the longest tenured person of color at the firm. In addition to serving as co-chair of the Fund Finance Practice Group, he currently serves as a member of the firm's Six-Person Appointments Committee, which appoints and oversees all the firm's strategic leadership and management roles, the Board of Directors, the Partners Compensation Committee, um, and Strategic Growth Committee. 
He formerly served as a co-chair of the firm's Attorney Development and Diversity Committee and as a member of its Racial Equality Advancement and Law Task Force. Albert has represented investment and commercial banks in more than 550 subscription secured credit facilities with a total value of $120 million in Asia, the US, Europe, Latin America, and global real estate infrastructure debt and buyout and <clears throat> energy private equity funds, including structuring and documenting some of the first subscription financing to real estate uh, PE funds in Japan, greater China, Singapore, and Korea and to some of the largest global infrastructure funds and Asia-focused buyout funds. Obviously, I could go on for another 40 minutes on the bios of all of our esteemed panelists, but um, without further ado, I would love to jump into the topics we have to discuss here. Uh, Vicki mentioned part one of this series and the survey. Um, let's discuss both of those topics in that order. Um, earlier this month in part one of the series, discussion topic focused on recruiting diverse uh, attorneys. And today we plan on segueing into a discussion about the importance of uh, retention of diverse attorneys. So Ricky, let's start with you. As an attorney, homegrown in Fish's Dallas office, uh, can you discuss the different types of diversity recruiting programs you've seen at your firm and why you think there's still a problem of retaining diverse attorneys within the legal industry? even after they're successful in their uh, recruiting programs? Yes, thanks, Phil. And I have got to say, it's always uh, all inspiring to be able to even virtually rub shoulders with folks uh, like those on this panel. Um, it takes that long to say those things because these folks have done so much. Uh, but one program I want to talk about in particular when it comes to FISH is one that's near and dear to me because as Phil mentioned, it's why I'm at FISH. It's called our 1L Diversity Fellowship Program. And so every year we select five uh, diverse 1Ls to come on as summer associates with the idea that eventually you know, they'll come to, um, to FISH as full-time associates and eventually be elevated to partner or to principal as we call them at FISH. My experience was, um, I wouldn't say it was unique, but it was a little harrowing when I was a 1L. I went to uh, Texas Tech, a criminally underrated school of law. Uh, and because of its ranking, I didn't get a lot of offers my 1L uh, summer. In fact, I sent out 77 applications on December 1st when NALP allowed me to do so. Uh, and I got 76 no's and one maybe. And that maybe was from FISH. And they were saying, well, we have this 1L diversity fellowship program. Why don't you look into that? So I applied to that. I was fortunate enough to get a position there. Um, and, uh, and I've been here ever since. And I think it's great. I would not have had that opportunity if it wasn't for a recruiting program like that. But as our topic here today is retention, there's a, 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 a less light side of that program. That program at FISH has been around since 2005, which means we have had five 1Ls every year since 2005 come to FISH. That's over 75 individuals that have come to FISH through this program. Of them, one was elevated to principal. All of the others uh, to this point have uh, have gone on to work in house or wherever they've gone, but they're no longer uh, at fish or they haven't gotten to the point of being elevated to principal. And so when it comes to retention, you know, I think that these kinds of programs like the diversity fellowship at, at fish, they're really important and they're actually doing a pretty good job of of finding talent, diverse talent and bringing them to law firms but then keeping them is another matter. Uh, we've certainly at FISH worked on improving the diversity fellowship to continue to foster that community so that uh, those that are at FISH through the program continue to stay and, and cultivate their careers here. And, and I, the, the one principal, I'm not gonna bury the lead, I guess, the one principal was me, um, and I'm not gonna be the last, I can assure you of that. So we've got to continue to do better though on that retention side, because, and I think we'll talk about it when we get to the survey as well, we're seeing that the summer associate numbers seem to be kind of following in line with the population, but when you start getting higher and higher up in the rankings within firms, uh, it falls off precipitously. So it's great that we've got these programs at the, at the beginning, but then once we get these folks in from the pipeline, how do we continue to retain them so that they can advance their careers uh, the way that we want it to be represented. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Phil, like, this is yeah. Stacey Maris. I just, you know, it would be interesting as a follow-on survey to find out where are all these 
associates going, right? Are they going in-house? Are they moving to a different career? You know, that would tell us a lot about um, what's, what's driving this and how we can address it. So yeah. <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah, and you know, Stacey, I can add just one thing, at least from, from our perspective with our program, most individuals end up going in-house by and large. They go in-house or they change careers. We don't see a lot of switching from one firm to another, uh, but mm -hmm. you know, why does that happen? Why don't they stay? Yeah. yeah. It's a great question and um, definitely a follow-up survey may be uh, overdue already. And um, Albert, I think, as the only other homegrown attorney here on the panel, um, you've been at the same firm for 27 years. What do you think are some of the keys to retention in a law firm? Um, for the, first of all, thank you for having me on this panel and um, and and in participating in this important topic. Um, so, you know, in the question of retention, it's just kind of thinking back, um, you know, similar to. Um, what Ricky said, you know, when I graduated law school way back when, um, the job market were, it was not all that vibrant as compared to, you know, kind of the bull run that we've been in the last several, basically the last decade, I guess. Um, so I was, when I was hired back in 1994, I was extremely grateful um, just, just having the opportunity. And I remember um, thinking to myself that, you know, it's, it's, you, you know, do everything you can within your power to work hard and take advantage of every opportunity that presents itself. So, um, but I think, you know, aside from just individual responsibility of gener being, you know, in terms of working hard and also um, taking advantage of opportunity that presents you, whether it's work assignments, whether it be, um, uh, uh, pro bono opportunities from a, from the associate's perspective, it's, it's, a, it's about always showing up and always putting in the maximum effort, um, recognizing that the legal field is a very competitive field. And, um, and, you know, you got to have some certain amount of grit and determination to, um, put into work and put into personal sacrifices. So assuming that all the associates who come through the door do that, I think for me, from a retention perspective, like putting on the partner's hat, I, I think as just thinking about how m the partners I worked with, how they um, guided me in terms of my career within, within the firm, it's actually the subtle things that they do that um, encouraged me. Um, uh, the, the, the positive feedback on work assignments, um, the social interactions of taking out the younger, taking the younger associates out, inviting them out for lunch, visiting with them. Um, that constant feedback and reinforcement of work product and also just basically informing the associate what is going on within the firm, where the associate fit within the, 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 the picture of the practice, within the picture of the, of the section, within the greater direction of the firm. So that you draw the associate in that you, what the associate is doing is a part of the, uh, of the co overall contribution to the firm. Um, because I think you, it's important to relate that component in the sense of, of, of showing the level of contribution that an associate is making, how it contributes to the, the practice group, the section, the firm, and also just in general, kind of talking to the associate about career advice, um, general guidance. I, I think it's, it's the personal interaction by the partner investing the time in the associate so that the associate knows someone cares about that individual, about, about him, him or her. Um, and I, that to me, as, as upon reflection, was a big part, uh, at least in, as an associate coming through the ranks, it made me feel like I, this is a place that I could, um, I could succeed in and, and that I have a, there is a plan 
a direction for me uh, within the firm. So, um, you know, we, you know, back, as I said, I mean, back, back when there wasn't, there was, we didn't really have any, as many of the formal programs that we have now for associates. I mean, it, it was very much um, uh, an ad hoc uh, arrangement. So um, I think now the associates, we have much more uh, formalized programs um, training, um, uh, you know, when they enter the firm. So, but I, I think what it boils down to just on reflection, it's the personal partner investment in the time in um, with the associate that that what matters at the, from my personal take of from a retention perspective. But it's a two way street. You have to remember, it's um, the associate has to be able to recognize that. Um, you know they have they they have an in and contribution to this bargain between between the, the law firm the, the 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 partner and associate relationship as well too. So thanks, yeah, Albert. I, I think Phil, if you don't mind, I'd like to add to that because you know as somebody who left a firm to go in house, you know part of the reason I left, I I started as an associate at a firm in Houston. I loved it. I was in the labor and employment section. I had a partner that I, you know, really felt like was my champion. He encouraged me. He gave me great projects. And when I moved to Dallas, I stayed with the same firm. Um, but, you know, the composition of the firm was very different in Dallas, primarily male. Um, and I really didn't have a champion. I didn't have that personal relationship. And I probably wasn't wise enough at the time to seek one out. And so my advice would be both, like Albert said, both to people who are trying to retain talent and to the people who are young associates or mid-level associates, those personal relationships are critical. There's almost nothing that will submit you in a firm more than having at least one relationship where you feel comfortable, you feel championed, and you feel like the firm is investing in you and believes in you. Yeah, I, I think you both touched on the importance of formal programs and organic relationships. Jill, do, can you talk a little bit about um, what some other things we need to do uh, would be to ensure that we are retaining diverse attorneys in our respective workplaces? I know that you're a big proponent of trailblazing, and could you touch on that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. What we need to realize, first and foremost, is that attrition is an issue across the board in law firms. And that is something that we really need to address because we, like no other really, you know, um, organization, we are our human capital. This is our talent. This is what we sell. This is the most important resource that law firms have is their people. And as we are thinking about that, we need to make sure that the, the lawyers of color are not the canaries in the coal mine who have a slightly greater attrition because as we show up in smaller percentages and for those who've gone through the survey, we show up in much smaller percentages by representation, yet we're beating the attrition numbers. So a couple of things I'd share on that. Number one is we talked about like feedback and relationships and all of that is very, very important. But where I find law firms sometimes do not do a good job is the ability to give the hard feedback soon enough and to, and to let people grow from that feedback, not fail as a result of it. So you, and I find that cross-culturally that tends to struggle. People don't feel like they can, they can be a different culture and, and have that conversation. Or they may miss the boat because of cultural subtleties, things that you are saying that you think, okay, I've, I've explained to them everything about their, their project and, and what they needed to do, but they didn't really catch that. You know, there are cultures, I will say African-American culture, we're pretty direct. You know, we will tell you this was bad <laughs> and let me tell you how you need to fix it. You know, saying, you know, it was all right. Um, I'm going to, you know, just kind of mark it up and get it out. That may be your signal from a partner that they really did not like it. But unless you are willing to have the uncomfortable conversations early, you know, that's important. The other thing I would share is that each of us 
um, have come through a generation of underrepresentation to now creating representation. The most humbling experience I had um, was last summer when an African-American uh, summer clerk said to me, thank you for existing. Now, let that wash over you. My mere presence told her it was possible. But then I also was in the middle of a one-on-one -on -one with her when that happened. I didn't just let her be there and she didn't just look at me as, as some icon. I, I interrelated with her. And that's important too. We have to scoop people up. We have to engage them because by the time you get a summer clerk position or an associate position at one of these law firms, we've taken you through the skill filter. Um, it is rarefied air. When you make it in, you have the skill, you have the raw intellect. Now we just need to figure out will and fit for the type of work that's being done. So I say, you know, in being a trailblazer, let's not make that something that's just a, a laudatory notion. Um, let's make that something that we are truly marking the trail, meaning we are explaining the ins and outs of the business, the realities of it, and bringing people along with real development and real instruction. Jill, do you think blazing that trail, and you know, we have a lot of questions coming in, so we'll try to get to as many as we can, but one of the questions that did come in was whether you think that the challenges today are different and tougher uh, for attorneys of color than they were 30 years ago. You talked about what it was like a generation ago, and if that is the case, you know, would it be trailblazing that makes it more difficult, or what are, what are your thoughts on that? I think it is absolutely a better environment now than when we were coming through. And, you know, I hesitate to talk about the number of decades that that is um, for me. But when, when I was a junior associate, there was no me. And now there is. There was no Albert. There was no Ricky. And now there is. And that does matter. Also, the hiring. This is a relationship business. If everybody was excluded, when my parents were coming up, you did not find African-Americans, Latinx, Asian in major law firms. You didn't. When I went to law school, my parents said, oh, guess you'll hang up a shingle. They knew no one. We are the first generation out of legal segregation in this country. So when you think about the need for relationships in a relationship business, who are we going to relate with? Well, now, if you look at in-house legal departments, there are people of color, there are women in unprecedented numbers. Our friends, our colleagues, you know, vertically, as, as this generation is coming up, they're going to see themselves in all of these spaces. Their relationships now matter. And that's also what's important for law firms to realize, that, that the marketplace is changing and being diverse is a very important thing for being able to hit all of the diversity that is out there in the marketplace. That's great. Thanks for that insight. Sakina, what do you think are some necessary prerequisites um, to become a trailblazer as Jill started talking about? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being with us to talk about this important topic of retention. And tagging on to what Jill said about the importance of kind of having the trailblazers, the summer associate that told her, you know, thank you for existing. I think that's so powerful. I've been lucky to be mentored by and learn from trailblazers, both at my firm and in the North Texas legal community. Many of those mentors are, are fellow panelists on this webinar here today. Um, and so I think that when we talk about trailblazers, what we're really talking about is people that have forged that path into the uncharted territory. Uh, as Jill mentioned, they brought people up behind them. So that means not only were they able to do it for themselves and be the first, but that they were also able to really help shape policies and influence the culture of their organization so that they don't remain the only. And I think that's what's so important because it does feed into that retention piece as well. And I think that that what that means in a traditional law firm environment is that you need to be economically empowered. It means having your own clients, your own book of business, being able to grow the pie. And so exactly to Jill's point, 
to be able to retain that talent, to give them the opportunity to thrive, we also need the help of our in-house counterparts who are helping in a huge way right now um, because the marketplace is changing. So it's incredibly valuable to me when we have a client that emphasizes diversity, a client that says, you know, I want you to staff your deals with an eye towards equity and inclusion. I mean, that directly impacts lawyers of color at firms. That gives us opportunities, mobility, it gives us freedom. So our friends at AT&T, at Toyota, you know, American Airlines, and there are so many others that are in-house clients that truly value diversity, equity, and inclusion, that is going to help us move the needle. But it's up to the law firms as well to do the work on their end um, on the retention piece, because if you don't have, you know, it all goes hand in hand. If you don't have people coming up the ranks to take that business and run with it, then um, there's only so much our in-house counterparts can do. Thanks, Akina. And that's a great segue to jump to Stacy here. How have you, Stacy, seen your role expand as a contributor to furthering DEI initiatives, um, not only within AT&T and your organizations, but also for outside counsel? That's a heavy burden to have um, to be ec economically empower some of your counterparts that are um, outside counsel. Sure. Um, so you know, uh, this summer I had a a moment, um, a real kind of um, breakthrough. I was, you know, thinking like everyone around, you know, certainly on this call and everyone around me, you know, with the events that followed on the George Floyd killing, um, you know, I did a lot of thinking about, you know, in our legal department, um, in our society, you know, how, how is race um, treated? How, you know, what can I do? And I, you know, I realized, like, I have always considered myself to be, a, you know, a champion of diversity. But in looking back, I realized, like, I really hadn't done anything other than just in my mind, feel like, you know, I'm open to diversity. I have friends of many races, but I had never done anything and shame on me. And so it was a real moment of you have to actively promote diversity. You have to think really deliberately about, you know, what can we do? And so that's what I did. That's what we did in the legal department. And, you know, we did many things, um, but one of the things that we did is we formed a diversity feedback committee in the legal department to share with us the, their insights on their experience in the department. Because what I learned is I really don't have insight into what it's like to be racially diverse in the AT&T legal department. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I, maintaining an open line of communication, address hearing hearing concerns, addressing concerns, really important. And then in terms of the, the you know, law firm community, um, you know, that's another area where, where you have influence, you have a responsibility to use that influence. And, you know, sponsoring a survey is certainly one of those things um, because, you know, until you identify what the, the realm of possibility is, where the problems are, where the issues are, then you can develop solutions to address them. And so, you know, we, we as a company think it's very important um, that our law firms uh, really give us uh, a good picture of their diversity and that they use diverse attorneys on our accounts. And by that, I don't mean bringing in, you know, a diverse pitch team and then, you know, once you really staff a matter, where are the diverse attorneys? They're not on the, the team. And so that's, you know, those are the kinds of things that we're really doubling down on and making sure that the diverse attorneys are on our accounts, working our accounts. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, I assume that would be insulting to your intelligence to have something like that happen. <laughs> um, it happens. It happens. I'm going to yeah. tell you, it happens more than you think. I've heard. Um, and turning to the second item that Vicki mentioned, I wanted to ask you, Stacey, just a quick two-part question. Uh, first off, you know, another thing AT&T has done and continues to do is um, sponsor underwrite surveys such as this, and we cannot thank AT&T enough for that um, and its efforts. And can you elaborate um, on how AT&T's role in sponsoring the survey dovetails with AT&T's overall diversity efforts um, and talk a little bit about how you feel 
um, to be a part or how you feel this to be a part of AT&T's responsibility. And the second part to that question is, you know, it's worth mentioning that while Hydric and Struggles' uh, 2020 U.S. board monitor showed a significant increase in women being appointed for seats among Fortune 500 companies, there's very little racial diversity among direct among directors, and I couldn't verify the exact statistic, but I think you are one of less than a handful of women serving at the corporate secretary level for a Fortune 500 company. So in addition to discussing AT&T's diversity efforts and responsibility at the corporate level, can you discuss what you feel your responsibility is and whether you feel any additional pressure or burden having that kind of personal responsibility as being in such rarefied air as a woman in your position? Sure. So, you know, as a, as a Fortune 10 or whatever company, AT&T, um, people do look to us to see what we're doing. And, um, you know, one of the things that we did um, in, this summer is uh, we made the commitment to share our EEO1 diversity numbers um, in the spring when, you know, probably spring to summer when um, we file that. That's something that we have never done before. And part of the reason that we're doing that is the same reason we sponsored the survey, which is, you know, we believe transparency is important because it's only when you scope the issue that you can monitor improvement and you can look at exactly what you guys are looking at is, you know, do we have a pipeline issue? Do we have a retention issue? What are our areas where we need to beef up our processes? And I think that everybody should be that transparent. I think that, you know, all the firms in Dallas should be participating in this survey. I think it's really important um, that we measure and that we monitor. And that, that's the only way that we're going to make progress. Um, in terms of my personal role, you know, I, I don't feel pressure in terms of, you know, I don't feel like, uh, you know, because I'm a woman, I have to perform better or, you know, I've never felt that. Um, but I do feel that I have an obligation, similar to what Jill talked about, um, to bring up women, to bring up uh, people of, you know, diverse communities, to make sure that everybody's getting those opportunities, you know, and, and I can't, I, we can devise programs, which we certainly have, but I've also done the additional thing, which is pick out three or four people that I really maintain close contact with, that I champion, that I, you know, have conversations with. You know, one of the things that um, we found, we did a kind of study of our uh, survey of our department um, after, you know, like in the July time frame. And one of the things that we learned is that, um, to the point that I think Jill made, people really want feedback, right? One of the things that we heard more than anything was, I need to know how I'm doing. I need to know where my performance is or is not successful. And I just don't have a sense of that. And, and that really surprised me because, you know, it, it just it surprised me. Because I, I had always thought, you know, people would rather just kind of be happy and go along. And, you know, I, I certainly never wanted to see critical feedback, but they do. They're hungry for it. Like, tell me what I need to do. And so um, that was, that I thought was a really profound thing that we realized from that, from that survey. Yeah. That's and great. feedback is also a proxy for development. They're not actually mm -hmm. saying rub me over a cheese grater, but they do <laughs> feel like, you know, let's, let's get yeah. developed. They know that they, they want to grow. And I see that so much mm -hmm. in this generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, and we'd be remiss if we didn't mention this. So some firms participated in the survey and some firms didn't or couldn't participate this year. Uh, but the survey did seem to strike up a lot of conversation within our legal community. Um, I want to ask the rest of the panel, um, what are your thoughts on the survey? I'll start with you, Sakina. Sure. So I want to start by echoing, thanking the people that put in the hard work to make the survey and report possible. So a huge thank you again to AT&T, to the Dallas Bar Association's Diversity Survey Report Committee and the Task Force and Canaris for all the time and effort 
for this really impactful report. It's comprehensive. It's a really excellent analysis of current representation in Dallas law firms and where the gaps are and where action still needs to be taken. So if you haven't read the report yet, I, I really encourage everyone in the audience to do so. Frankly, we regret that our firm didn't participate in the survey this year. We've historically supported and participated in the Dallas Diversity Task Force reports over the years that the DBA and the sister bar associations have helped put together. Internally in 2020, I can say at Haynes and Boone, we've been very focused on redoubling our efforts on DEI. We've spent hundreds of collective hours in 2020 on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives and formed a new task force in addition to our longstanding diversity, equity, and inclusion committee to really take an honest look in the mirror when it comes to all of these issues that we're talking about here today, including the important topic of retention, and to really propel us forward on some action items to more specifically address each of these issues. Um, so not participating in this particular survey was a missed opportunity for us, but we're fully planning on and committing to participating in the next survey from the committee. And we look forward to partnering with AT&T, the DBA and Canaris on it. Um, but I thought as I read through the report, there were some really, uh, some, you know, some of the data was expected just given what we all know about the legal industry, but some of it was surprising. So I'm looking forward to seeing maybe some additional survey questions the next time this rolls out and seeing what the data shows us on the next go round. Thanks, Akina. Jill, what, what were your thoughts as a Dallas office managing partner? So I think at the time the survey came around, I was not in this role, so I'm not certain if, if we were requested to do it. But what I'll say about information gathering is that for the duration of my practice, um, and it started in the last millennium, I'll confess that, um, we've had the same conversations and we've had the same numbers. And so it's very important to me that we are actually doing something about it. And that's one of the things that really excites me about Perkins Coie. Um, our strategic diversity committee was you know, active, formed, and really thinking about the building blocks of success to really have historically underrepresented people um, in law firms be able to thrive. And I want to be careful that we that we don't start using diverse as a euphemism for not white. Um, we need to start saying when we're talking about people who are historically underrepresented, because I think that that helps people to understand that. Um, our commitment to racial equity, we are looking at getting people on boards. We are looking at putting money in addition to the foundation money that we put into communities in which our offices are. Um, we're looking at putting money specifically into um, activities and organizations that have a real racial impact, a real equity impact across the nation. And so we're, we're putting our money where our mouth is, we're putting our activities where our mouth is, and our leadership. Um, we have people of color and people of different gender orientations at the highest levels in our law firm. You know, I am not the only leader of color across the country. There are several of us. We lead uh, practice groups, we lead offices, we sit on MANCOM, we sit on executive committee. And that to me is, is living that. We too have the, the 1L diversity program, but we try to live it because it is my goal that when I stop practicing law, that we will not still have the same conversations that we had when I began practicing law, that we will have actually been the difference we wanted to see. That's great. Yeah, great. I, I want to, oh, can I follow up on something yeah. she said? Because I think it is important what she said about, you know, di diverse communities, right? Like it's not just race, it's disability, it's LGBTQ, it's, you know, and and we made at at and when we were putting together our diversity feedback committee, we tried really hard to get, you know, a, a broad representation. And we, um, we made a mistake. We had a, um, a gentleman on the committee from India and we didn't have anybody of Asian descent. You know, we thought that that would sort of fill that role. And we got overwhelming feedback from our people like, no, that's not enough, right? You need to have, and so, 
you know, we, we're still learning, you know, we're learning and growing and, and, you know, of course, addressing everything we get. But, you know, one thing that I, I will say is to anybody that's on this call, I really do encourage you to speak up. And, you know, the only way that the leaders that are on this call, the leaders that are in your firms or your, your office, you know, offices will know is if you speak up. And that's, it's just critical because, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And, you know, we stumble into mistakes, you know, probably more than I even realize. And so I just encourage you to speak up. Yeah, I agree. And we don't know what we don't know and more is more in terms of information. And that's what the survey helps us do. And Ricky, um, as the recruiting partner, recruiting principal of FISH, um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to share your thoughts on the survey as well. Sure, and I won't take up too much time here because I know we've got about 15 minutes left and I know what some folks are going to talk about. I'm excited to hear those things. But there's one thing that really struck me looking at this is just kind of the practical effect of what these numbers are. Uh, it, the, the survey says that Dallas County is 40.8% Hispanic or Latinx. And that number shocked me. And it shouldn't because I am Latino. But it surprised me because I spend most of my time working with my with the folks I work with, with my colleagues at work. Sure, I have my family and my close personal friends, but the people that I see, it doesn't look like it's 40% looking like me. And so instead, the number is actually more five or 6%. And so there's a lot of changes that need to be made, obviously, so that our legal field and the industry looks more like the public that we serve. Uh, but just the fact that it surprised me so much to realize just how much of this county is Hispanic or Latinx it just goes to show that there is a practical side to this, right? We aren't, not only am I not seeing folks that look like me, so I'm not, we're not seeing that representation, but I don't realize that my community looks like that as well because we're so ingrained in what we're doing at work. And work becomes such a big part of your personal life. Uh, I just think it's so important that those numbers start to catch up. It's gonna take a long time. It's gonna take a lot of work. It took a long time to get to the five or 6% number we're at now. Um, and not just for, for Hispanic and Latinx, but every other version of diversity, whether that's also LGBTQ or disability. Um, it's just seeing a number like that and being surprised, having a visceral reaction to that number, I think is a really good example of just how there are, you know, there are real consequences to the way that these uh, systems are set up such that somebody like me just doesn't realize there are a lot more Latinos around me than I thought. Mm. Um. Albert, I, I want to talk a little bit about that, right, and the responsibility there um, to, to improve upon numbers and not just for statistic purposes, but, you know, you serve on Haynes and Boone's Appointments Committee, and you're the first person of color to be on that committee, and could you speak about uh, a little bit about what that means as a diverse attorney, the, the uh, committee's authority and um, what the committee is responsible for doing and how that translates into your role as a uh, diverse attorney? Um, sure. I, I think, you know, the, the way, you know, our, um, the way I'm looking at it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a tremendous amount of responsibility, obviously, in the sense of, you know, in a, in a large law firm, which is a very complex organization, um, the, the organization itself has a wide body of constituents. And, um, from the perspective of what we're trying to do as an institution, we're always looking out for what's in the best interest of, of the firm. And you are looking at um, appointing leaders in the firm who can uh, facilitate and represent the different constituents it, uh, within the firm. Um, pre people serving on the committee, people leading sections, um, so you're looking at a lot of factors beyond just race and gender. Um, there, there's all kinds of data that we have to look through. Um, but I think the main point is, is that I think it's what is to me why it was important to me to, to serve on this committee is, is to hopefully bring a different perspective to this selection process, this appointment process. Um, there are many of us who, uh, show up as a first year law student or as a um, summer associate who um, you know, may not have the same background. Uh, you know, I remember um, 
going through law school um, and asking my parents, you know, talking about, they were asking me how I liked law school and, um, you know, just a bit of a personal story. I mean, we, you know, my, my parents are immigrants. I'm an immigrant um, and they have very little rudimentary education. So we own a corner grocery store. So try to explain to your parents what law school was like and classmates and what, what that process like. It's, I remember um, just thinking about it, it's getting me choked up. Um, hold on a second. Take your time. I remember my dad say to me, I can't help you. And uh, it's, 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 I'm not familiar with where you're, where you're at. So to, 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 to come from, from that level of, to where, where I'm at, it's bring that perspective of someone who, you know, first generation, second generation, whatever, but we have a lot of colleagues who, whose parents are partners in law firms and um, they can share the stories, what it's like being a lawyer. So that's a competitive advantage. And, and, and so I think for me, what I'm trying to represent is really the underrepresented in the sense of sharing, so bring a different perspective, cultural background, just different sort of opinion that I think would make the organization and, um, and the practice of law much more um, as it ties into the community, right? As it ties into the kind of what we do every day, because at the end of the day, the business of law is relationship, personal relationships, and that's how you develop client relationships. Um, and I think that's why I think it's especially important uh, when we think about this, it's, it's that we, we, we come from different backgrounds. And, um, and in order for any organization to thrive, we have to respect um, the, the perspective of, of different people. It just makes the organization better and makes the decision process better. Um, and you know, I think it, it's benefited my career in the sense of the clients I represent uh, and I continue to represent. And um, you know, so it's, it's, I think you know, that to me is, um, you know, is, is what I keep in mind, what, you know, in terms of my role and, uh, and in a way, the responsibility that I feel uh, as the, you know, longest serving attorney color at Haynes and Boone and, and the example that I feel like I need to set, um, you know, for, for, for folks coming behind me. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And I, I know your career benefited from it, but I know Haynes and Boone did as well. So um, definitely appreciate that story. Um, I want to touch on this topic before we wrap up because it's an important one. One of the many criticisms of the i initiatives, including you know, this particular survey, is that uh, they disenfranchise attorneys who do not qualify as being diverse um, because such attorneys do not benefit from the DEI efforts. Some say that this is a form of reverse racism uh, because they do not get a slice of the proverbial pie. Um, I, I want some of you to weigh in on that. Jill, do you want to start us off? Certainly. You know, I think that we have to come from a place of education to be able to really address that. So number one, when you look at our, the survey numbers, we are, we are inverted in terms of representation versus population. So if we were actually occurring as we would normally occur in the population, we wouldn't see the outsized differences in numbers in representation. So if, if you, you need to keep more than 90%, I think it's like 1% of, of you know, uh, equity partners at law firms or African-American females. So if you need to keep 99%, I'm probably not gonna be able to help you. Um, and, and there's some reasons why that's that issue. But when I talk about education, you need to look at a book called The Color of Law. That really explains how people of color were disenfranchised by law 
from the ability to have access to capital and to housing and to healthcare and to loans and all kinds of things that helped not a hundred years ago, not 400 years ago generation, my parents' generation that you know were not able to reap the benefits. Every, every male since in my father's family since World War II has served in every single war. And yet they were not able to benefit from GI Bill dollars. And that matters in terms of everything else that the domino effect. So I would say you have to come at it from a place of education to begin to have the conversation. The next thing is it's about building a market. If it's not just something that you think, you know, adds to the quality of what you are, you're producing in terms of product, or you don't like the idea of just sort of equity generally, how about your pocketbook? Because if you're not creating market, if, if more of the population is people of color than not, then you're not empowering their purse. And if they cannot become buyers and active participants in the marketplace, you have a very shrinking market. Companies that are figuring that out are realizing that their diversity is their strength, is their market power. So that would be my response to that. Thanks, Jill. Sakina, what, what are your thoughts on this topic? Yeah, no, so what Jill just shared reminds me of something that I heard that really struck a chord with me. And um, it's a quote, if you're accustomed to privilege, then parity feels like a step down. And I'm going to repeat that because it really it was powerful when I heard it. So if you're accustomed to privilege, Parity feels like you're taking a step down. I heard that at a Corporate Council Women of Color conference from Christy Hobbiger, the founder of Latina Magazine. And so to me, what that means is that's really, you know, a, a very precise way of answering that question that you posed, Phil, which is if you're used to being in the majority, lifting others up may feel like you're losing out on privileges you were used to. So I think the question is, why are we so focused on preserving the status quo? You know, if we are truly wanting diversity, equity, and inclusion, we have to implement policies that drive parity. And so if someone is bent out of shape because a corporate legal department is emphasizing having lawyers on their team that are women, lawyers of color, LGBTQ, veterans, persons with disability, I think that really is an opportunity for that person's own self-reflection and an opportunity for them to ask themselves, you know, why am I feeling threatened by a historically disadvantaged group getting an opportunity? Um, so yeah, I think questions like that are really just opportunities for, for education, like Jill mentioned, and for reflection and conversation. Yeah, so true. It's the building of more. The fact that you have sliced the pie is not redacting the pie, it's increasing the pie. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very um, valid point. And I, I like to kind of emphasize that, which is we're making the pie bigger in the sense of the clientele, thinking about the clientele of there are a lot of business owners and people who are uh, decision makers who are, um, uh, person of color, um, of different race and gender. That bond that we share open, make the pie bigger. And at the end of the day, we, the end goal for all of us is hopefully is to make the pie bigger for not only our institutions, but just for our, all of our business to thrive so that we could continue to, to, to do what we do and live the life that we live, which is, you know, we're all very grateful um, but at the end of the day, this is not a zero sum game. This is we're trying to make the pie bigger for everybody and, um, and to, to basically so that everyone enjoys the, the, the boat rising, the tide coming in, all the boat rise. Yeah, and I just want to add one last thing. I know we're running out of time, but the, part of your question, Phil, was that these folks feel like they don't benefit from DE and I, I reject that premise. Um, yes, you do benefit. You get to meet you get to meet attorneys like uh, like Albert, um, like Jill, like Sakina, like Stacey. Uh, you get to meet these folks, learn from them. It improves the place where you're working, which should improve your life as well. So to say that you don't benefit from it just because you don't necessarily aren't directly taking advantage of it, 
you know, that whole, that question of parity, that, that quote that, that Sakina uh, shared with us, I just, I just reject that premise. I don't think it's true. You do absolutely benefit from it. Everybody does. Uh, and the quicker we get these numbers looking the way they should, the more quickly we'll get those benefits. Thanks, Ricky. And you're right, I think we are just about out of time, so I will pass the baton to Vicky. But thank you all for your insight, your stories. This was great. Thanks, Bill. Thank you all. This has been, wow, a powerful, powerful discussion. And I know there's so much meat there. Know that it will be, it was recorded and it will be on the DBA website. Um, you can also go to the DBA, um, I think it's dallasbar.org diversity tab to um, download the survey report itself. If you want to take a little time and just review those responses. Um, so much meat there. Albert, you're, you're sharing that. I think I, I'm so glad my camera was off. It, it spoke so deeply to us all. Um, the Q&A blew up on that. Um, Jill, the the what you cited as you know this one percent um, and the lack of access to capital Sakina if you're stepping back from privilege then parity does feel like you know some abusive situation Ricky being homegrown coming up from a 1L in the firm knowing how the pipeline has helped you and certainly Stacy and you know Many of you know that I am in-house counsel at AT&T, so I see what Stacy is doing and making a difference within the in-house legal department. And certainly, Phil, again, giving your time along with all the other committee members. We thank you so much. And now, as we will continue to survey in the future, I'm not sure if it will be annual, but there will be some measurement of our progress and our work but know that the work also begins as the Ally Bar uh, Equity on Equity Standing Committee will um, take the survey as a tool and will implement programs. So look for that committee, which will be is co-chaired um, by Chloe Spurlock and Paul Stafford and a myriad of a host of other folks. So if you want to work on these initiatives and move the dial forward, we invite you to join us. Again, thank you so much. Thank you for the participation in the survey and have a fantastic afternoon. Do we have a CLE number, Phil, that you can read for us, please? We do, we do. Um, it is 174-116-438. I'll repeat that one more time, 174-116-438. All right, then. Well, thank you so much. And please enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you all.